Hey everyone, Wayne Fox here. You know, recently I did a video talking about some of my backup strategy and was mainly focused on how RAID 5 isn't intended to be used to as a backup to safeguard your data. In that video, I mentioned I recently was able to upgrade to gigabit fiber and I decided to give Backblaze a try for my off location backups. Previously, I had a couple of hard drives I kept at a different location in my daughter's house and would try to remember to pick them up once a week or so, back up the changes, and then drop them back off. <laughs> Needless to say, that's not a very effective way to back up your data off-site. It's really inconvenient and pretty easy to just not bother until suddenly you realize it's been a couple of months. Sort of defeats the purpose of an off-site backup. Now, fortunately, I was never in a position that I needed it. A cloud backup solution has a lot of advantages, but over the years, there were just too many issues associated with using the cloud, such as the slow upload speed of my internet provider, only 14 to 15 megabits a second. They had a monthly limit of data, which was one terabyte, and I had a lot more data than that. To make it even somewhat useful, you had to sort of be really selective on what you backed up and that just took too much time. So when I upgraded to the Gigabit Fiber, I watched a few videos on the different options and settled on Backblaze as the one I would try. You know, I chose Backblaze for a few reasons. First, there isn't a limit on storage. I figured I had about 24 gigabytes of data I needed to store. It was easier to just dump it all than to try to figure out what I really might not need. Second was the option to allow a one-year version history for only a little bit more each month. You know, there's been rare occasions where I wanted to go back and retrieve something from a previous version because I messed it up or I just wanted to remember it. And while not as convenient as something like Time Machine, it's more than enough for the rare times I need it. The other thing I like is there's times when I'm traveling and I want to pull a little bit of a clip from an old video to add to a new video. And before I really couldn't do that, but now I can jump onto Backblaze and pull an old file for use in a new video relatively easily. Most of the time, your speed when you're downloading is pretty fast, so it works pretty good. So far, I've been pretty happy with the results. It's pretty transparent and seems to work as advertised. Price isn't too bad, and I like the simplicity of their pricing model, and the interface to retrieve the file is, is adequate. I thought what I might do is go over a few things in the process of setting it up that I struggle with, really not in the sense of doing anything and how to do it, but more an understanding of why it seemed so slow when I first started. Now, to be honest, my expectations were pretty unrealistic. I guess I figured I'd start it up and it would just start dumping my data at around one gigabit per second. I figured in two or three days it would be done. But as I started up, it just seemed to crawl. Well, after doing some serious web searching, I stumbled across this gem of a post by Brian W. Ski. That's his username on Reddit. His info says he is the CTO of Backblaze. I did a little digging and it appears that this is from none other than Brian Wilson, one of the founders, as well as being one of those writing much of the code for Backblaze. In fact, in his disclaimer, he claims that I work at Backblaze and wrote the code that uploads files right from the horse's mouth. Wow, after reading through their information, making a couple changes to the settings in Backblaze and then being patient, it all came together and ended up being really, really fast. I think it only took about five days. So if you're curious as to what might be happening as well as some insight into the back end of just how Backblaze is handling your data, I'll give it my best shot. I might throw a few quotes from this article below and I'll certainly link it in the description box below. Now, one thing to note, this post is two years old and as he mentions, they are trying to improve things. So I assume some things might have changed a little. However, after watching the process over the five days, I'm guessing it's still pretty accurate because what I saw is what he describes. First thing, let's take a look at Backblaze's setup and preferences. These settings can make a big difference and depending on your computer's power and available RAM, as well as the speed of your connection, you can really make a difference in the upload speed. Another factor is how far you are away from the Backblaze servers. So Backblaze puts a little icon in my menu bar and I can just go to Backblaze preferences to get the main window. Not a lot to it, it has a backup now which if you have it set to backup only when you want to, you can use. Uh, most of the time you will just wanna let it back up automatically. Here are some restore options. It allows several options, three of which are free. I find that just going to the website via browser works pretty good. It does have this USB drive option, which if you need a lot of data sent, in my case, I have 24 terabytes, so I doubt if that would even be available to me. But if you lost everything, it might be an option you'd check into. The settings we wanna take a real quick look at. First of all, these are the different devices that it's going to back up. 
your system drive, you have no choice. It will back it up automatically. You can tell it which of your other drives you want it to back up. So the main thing we want to look at here is the performance pane. Normally, this is set to automatic, and when it's set to automatic, it limits your threads to eight, as you'll see here. It also has an automatic throttle on your bandwidth, and if you have a fairly fast connection, that's really not good. Better is to turn it to manual. The throttle slider selects how much of the bandwidth you're going to allow it to use in the upload and will throttle the bandwidth. It's not throttling your computer. So if you have a really fast connection, then there's no reason not to move it all the way to the right. As far as threads, I would recommend going all the way to 100 if you have plenty of RAM and a fast network connection. There's no reason to throttle it down to less. I think 30 is probably the minimum you wanna try. Unless you have a really slow connection, he mentions in the post that if your connection is slow and you have too many threads, you can starve the upload and actually it will time out before it completes and you won't ever get anything backed up. Here's the schedule. In my case, I actually have it come on once a day at 3 a.m. My hard drive that I back up turns on at five minutes to three. And so it will back up to Backblaze first, then it will back up to my local drives, unmounts those drives and then shuts them down. Here are some exclusions, and you'll notice there are quite a few exclusions listed here. These are folders that are excluded, and down here are a lot of file types that are excluded. The one that I notice, sparse image and DMG, those might be somewhat of an issue for some people. I do have a DMG that I would like to back up, and right now it's not, so I'm trying to figure out how I can specify a specific file. I haven't got that far yet. You can add custom folders to this. So if you have a folder somewhere that you don't want to back up for some reason, for example, in my case, I've got this temporary files folder. You know, I might want to go to my Dropbox and not bother backing that up because I've already got it on Dropbox. Okay, so now that we sort of understand the concept of threads and how we can affect and give the computer more resources, let's talk a little bit about how Backblaze does the process. First of all, it uploads the files from the smallest to the largest. Now this is irregardless of hierarchy. It doesn't start with a folder and go smallest to largest in the folder. Basically it finds the smallest file and all the files it's gonna send starts there and goes larger. And this is the main reason it's slow at first. Most computers have hundreds of thousands of very small files that need to be backed up first. So the upload will appear pretty slow and we'll get to that reason why in just a second. If the file's under 100 megabytes, it's handled differently than if it's over 100 megabytes. For files that are under 100 megabytes, Backblaze handles each one as a single file upload. So each file goes through a thread and it's just like uploading a file or downloading a file, it's, it's sent straight. It can use multiple threads, but will rarely saturate more than 10 to 20, you know, working with eight, 10, 20 files at a time. It really can't work with 100 files at a time in this process. So you won't see the threads being fully utilized at this point. Typical computer, as I mentioned, has hundreds of thousands of these small files, and each one requires an HTTPS connection to be created and torn down. Uploading these small files won't take advantage of the bandwidth at all. Uh, the speed is really hindered by all the overhead of the transfer protocol, which is required and is the same for every file, no matter the size. Now, once we get to files over 100 megabytes, this changes the way it does things, and that's where it begins to get a little more efficient. They're uploaded one at a time, and it doesn't start the next file until one file is finished. And he mentions that's a process they're trying to evaluate, but at this point, I think that's still how it works. So if we have a file that's over 100 megabytes, it's handled a little differently. The first thing it does, it takes that 100 megabyte file and it breaks it down into 10 megabyte chunks. And he says exactly 10 megabytes. They're all numbered from one to whatever. And the last chunk is just take the file size divided by 10 and that's how big the last chunk will be. Once it's created those chunks, it will actually need to use RAM because it works with those in RAM. And I think at this point, it's only gonna be needing four to eight gigabytes of RAM, so most computers have plenty. It needs two to three gigabytes for the overhead of the process, plus you know at least one gigabyte for the 100 chunks if it's working with it at a time. It takes those chunks and it begins to upload those uh, through each through a thread, each through their own thread, uh, through a, their own connection to Backblaze and uploads them there. Once threads are finished, it will continue to upload other threads and at some point, all the threads will be at Backblaze and the file will be reassembled into the original file. 
I put 150 megabyte file just as an example, but really this is anything greater than 100. Once those are there, all the files at Backblaze, and I think this is happening simultaneous. I don't think it waits till they all get there or anything. Once a file arrives at Backblaze, and then this is everything, it breaks that file into what are called shards, and it cut, breaks it into 17 shards. It then calculates three parity uh, pieces or shards, and you have a grand total of 20. Each individual shard is loaded to an individual, what they call a pod. Those pods are basically the equivalent of a server. And those are very interesting. I thought I would maybe talk about the pods for just a minute. I read a fascinating article, I'll link it below, written by Backblaze about how it works. But as I mentioned, each pod's like its own server with multiple hard drives. Now this could be 100 hard drives for all I know. I'm guessing it's a pretty large number. Now each pod has drives one through whatever, and it will take each of those shards and load them on the same drive number of each pod. So if it's going to use the third drive in pod one, then shard two goes to the third drive in pod two, shard three goes in third pod, pod, the third pod drive in pod three. I can't even get that out of my mouth. So basically each of those 20 shards are located on the same physically located drive within each of those pods. Now, the good part about that is because it's a triple parity system, it's not RAID 5, which is a single parity. It's not RAID 6, which is a double parity. Basically, as these drives get bigger and bigger, the only way to really solve the parity problem is to add parity drives. And at this point, I guess three is enough. Uh, but anyway, as long as any 17 pieces, any 17 shards are available, it can reconstruct your file. So as it would take four of these pods or four of the drives in these pods to go down before you couldn't access your data. And I don't believe this has ever happened in the history of Backblaze. These uh, pods or servers, according to Brian, are located in different locations, which I means, I don't know what that means. I, don't, I know they're in the same facility, but I assume they're somehow isolating them so that perhaps if one or two get burned or three get burned or something happens, it can't really affect all of them. Pretty fascinating. So now to restore a file, it's basically you take all of those pods, you take all and you grab all of those shards. And as I mentioned, you can then reconstruct your file. And as along as 17 of the 20 shards are valid, that file can be reconstructed. As I read more and more, this is a process they've really engineered themselves. The platform they use is very customized. It's not even based on Linux RAID. And basically what these pods are to me is a distributed RAID. So instead of you know, 20 drives in one RAID cabinet controlled by one RAID controller. It's taking each of those sections that and distributing them over 20 different controllers, 20 different servers. Uh, pretty ingenious to me. Now, I've never heard of anybody having trouble with Backblaze. I always assume they had redundancy, meaning that your file was in multiple locations. Instead, they've opted for this distributed system. And for all I know, this idea of triple redundancy or triple parity is pretty common in these uh, backup storage type sites. I don't know. Uh, possibly most data centers work this way. Got me curious enough, I'll probably be doing a little research. Anyway, so far I've been really happy with Backblaze. It was pretty fast upload. I've actually gone and pulled files over on several occasions just to test it. One thing I've noticed is on the Macintosh, you have what is called a package. For example, in my ScreenFlow program, the document is actually a package, and a package is really a folder that's treated as an individual file. And you can open a package by right-clicking on it, saying show package contents. It looks like a normal folder. Well, once it goes to Backblaze, it is a folder and it appears as a folder on their server. So if you have a package that's been stored there, like my ScreenFlow data, uh, you'll pull that folder back over and I assume it will be remade into a package. I don't know, that's something I need to test. Actually, let's just find out right now. Let's go to Backblaze. We're gonna open it from the menu here and we're gonna go ahead and select the restore option. I'm going to use the Backblaze app to do the restore. It's going to have me log in and I logged in through uh, Google. And so I just have to choose my account on Google. It will log me in. Now I can go back to Backblaze and this is the Restore app. It's going to go on to the cloud and basically show 
a hierarchy of all my files. Uh, I've got a lot, so it's gonna take just a minute. In this case, this backup is kind of buried. It's inside this, it's inside backups, it's inside, <laughs> and don't ask me about this, it's inside this, inside another backups and inside this backup. And there's my working video folder. Uh, one of these days I'm gonna clean that all up. Let's just go down and pick one of these. We're gonna go to one I just recently did, a teleprompter, let's open that up. And then let's go to the teleprompter screen flow. You'll see it's listed as a file, even though this is a folder if you go on their website. Let's just say restore that. Now it will restore it to any location I want. In this case, I've got it set to restore to a folder called Backblaze Restore. And that's just in my temporary folder. So we'll tell it to restore there and just kind of see what happens. And as you can see, I've already done this. It sees that it's available and I don't need to restore it. So we're just gonna tell it to cancel that restore and we'll say, okay. Now let's go ahead and go to that folder and temporary files. And what I found interesting was this restored the full hierarchy. And there is my restore app and you'll notice it is a screen flow document. And if I double click on it, it will open up and there's the document completely restored. So restore works just great for packages. And in fact, all your restores restore the full hierarchy. So if you restore, for example, a full volume, you just pick the whole volume, all the folders, all the hierarchy that you had will also be restored, not just the files. But anyway, other than that, I haven't seen any real problems or caveats. Uh, if I have any more experiences, I'll let you know. If you use Backblaze or a different server, please comment below and give other people your opinion. Like I said, I thought this was the most reasonable for the amount of data that I had to store. And so far, so good. Anyway, hope you found it interesting. Hey, thanks for watching. See ya.